or whatever it All is. All right, West guys, welcome to this evening's live stream. It is a very special happy hour live stream where we are all here together jason hartman <laughs> ken mcelroy and yours truly george gammon the amateur in the equation here with these two amazing real estate <laughs> professionals right here and we are going to go ahead and answer some of your questions i think uh kenny's already started drinking he's got himself a coors light right there hey george why do we have a double drink we Oh, I think Jason, you got we got a lag here. We we had a uh, we had a double. There was like an echo for a while. I think it's gone. Oh, I think Jason, you got, you got a lag here. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's okay. you got about a fifteen second lag, Jason. Kenny, can you hear me in real time as my mouth moves? <laughs> yes, you're good. Uh, so okay. I'm good. No, I'm going to go out and I'm going to go and come back. I'll be right back. Okay. All right. All right, Kenny. So we've got 118 people on right now. Uh, usually, I think I'll probably get up to about a thousand here. So for the people who are in early into this night, into tonight's live stream, let's go ahead and answer a couple questions. You guys, you are on live with one of the top real estate experts in the commercial real estate field on the planet earth so what questions do you have uh let's see here let me go through the stream well kenny i guess we could kind of start with this one it's they said when is the everything bubble going to crash it looks like home loan volume is slowing down so you and I discussed this briefly on our interview the other day that hasn't gone live yet. So I'd encourage everyone to stay tuned for that. But what do you think? I mean, the real estate, that the residential real estate, obviously at all time highs. So that would imply that um, we're a little bubblicious there and definitely yeah. expensive. But what do you think about uh, this metric that the home loan volume is slowing significantly. Maybe home lo or maybe home prices have gotten to a point where people just can't afford them anymore, even at these super low interest rates, because it always boils down to a, a monthly payment. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, you, you said it, George, is perfectly said. The, the truth is that uh, we are in an affordability issue and, and now we're starting to see rents rise too. So, you know, rent, yeah. you know if, you, if you had rentals, uh, obviously in the last year and a half, you, you know, you were struggling like, like that's what we had. You know, we have uh, almost 10,000 rentals and, you know, we were struggling collecting and people were hurting and all those kinds of things. And we were dealing with banks and forbearance and people not being able to pay and all that kind of stuff. You know, it looks to me like the eviction moratorium and the, you know, forbearance piece is not going to be renewed after the end of the month or, or the end of this month, which is June. So, right. I, I would guess that, you know, they're going to have to rip the bandaid off here and we're going to start to see all that stuff percolate up to the top. That would be my guess. And so that would be mean more inventory. And that would mean, uh, you, you know, usually typically more inventory means lower prices. Yeah. So Jason, you've really got your finger on the pulse of residential real estate and rentals more specifically with these single family homes, uh, starter homes and in linear markets. What have you seen over the past year as far as the renters paying rent? Are, are you seeing a lot of them kind of take advantage of the fact that they can't get kicked out if there's a Fannie and Freddie loan? Or are you seeing the majority of them pay because you deal mostly in A and B neighborhoods? Yeah. Uh, what, what What's your take on that? Yeah, George, that's a really good question. I hope the sound is coming through. Uh, it is. It is. It's a little strange here. I, I don't know what's going on, but um, uh, you know, we were very worried about that uh, when when these moratoriums were announced. We were super concerned, uh, but uh, it just didn't turn out to be that big of an issue at all. Uh, really, just sort of a non-issue, frankly, uh, for us. Uh, couple clients here and there complain that there were uh, troubles with rent collection. And um, uh, some of our clients did take advantage of forbearance at first, but then they realized they were to keep buying more properties. And, uh, you know, lenders won't won't let you buy more if you're in a forbearance program. Uh, 
Uh, so they, mm -hmm. they quickly jumped out of that. Um, but uh, just largely a non-issue, um, surprisingly. I, I think that's a little bit more of an issue for institutional apartment owners. And I think Ken just yeah. addressed it. Unfortunately, I couldn't hear his response because of the sound problems. Yeah, okay. So here's a question from Sean. And I'd uh, direct this probably towards Jason and, and Kenny, see if you've got some thoughts on this. He's asking, should I pay extra towards my mortgage or invest the difference? My mortgage is at 2.75%. And Sean, I'm going to assume that's a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. That's not, uh, it doesn't adjust. It sounds like he just listened to a live stream with Dave Ramsey. What do you think, Hartman? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh I, I'm I'm never gonna say pay more for your mortgage when that money's so cheap that it's basically free. They're paying you to borrow. You know, keep that mortgage. If you can get a longer mortgage at a reasonable interest rate, take the longer mortgage and never pay it down. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Rick Edelman, but he's been on my show a couple of times and he has this um this great DVD. That's how old it is. It's called 10 Great Reasons to Carry a Big Long Mortgage and Never Pay It Off. He's a well-known mm -hmm. financial advisor, and uh, he's right. Yeah, yeah Ken, yeah. Kenny, what are you doing personally? Because I know you use not a lot of low leverage. I think you were saying about a fifty percent LTV, but uh, you know, you, if you've got a billion dollars out there and doors, that still means you got about five hundred million in loans, which is a little bit more yeah. than the average door, Gene. So, <laughs> what, <laughs> how do you manage that in your own funds? Yeah. So, so first of all, we don't necessarily borrow that in the beginning when we're buying something. So we're buying uh, two projects in Houston right now, uh, 648 units total. And uh, we're actually doing a 75% loan on that deal. Um, and, mm. But what happens, George, over time is as the deal gets seasoned, as you start to pay it down, as the tenants pay it down for you, I should say, uh, you, you know, uh, then all of a sudden your, you know, your your loan to value because the value goes up and the and the debt goes down, the debt, um, you know, principal goes down because it's being paid down every month. So that's why we're we have those low numbers. So right now as a company, you know, we're somewhere in the 55% range loan to value, but we typically buy, you know, in the 75, even 70, but on our new construction, we're probably more like 65, but um, mm -hmm. we never, we never really go really, really high on leverage. Like, like a lot of folks, I'd rather put more money down. And uh, to Jason's point, I think that's exactly right. What you want to do is you want to use that cash. It's not good to be in cash as we all know, because of impending inflation, but, what you want to do is you want to mirror that up with more debt at the price that you already have, because, you know, we already know, I mean, it's facts that the inflation's at you know, well over 4% right now. And if you take a look at all these other shadow stats and all these other, all these other things, it's right. probably a lot more. So you're, if you're borrowing below inflation, you should stay there and, you know, not use your cash because your cash could be used to match it up with, borrowing again below inflation. So that's that's what I would suggest. Yeah, I think that a lot of people, well, I think most people are looking at this through the lens of being an owner occupant. If they're looking at it from a lens of, you know, they own an apartment complex or in Jason's case, they own single family homes that they use as rental properties. It, it might be slightly different. I mean, one strategy there that I, I think is, prudent that may be uh, wise for people to consider is a complete opposite of that uh, from a standpoint of, uh, you know, if you buy a property, you know what you're doing. Let's say you buy a, a property that's worth uh, the comps are uh, $100,000 and you go in and buy that property for 50,000 and then you put 10 or 15 into it to fix it up. And now all of a sudden it's worth 100,000. Uh, you've built in a tremendous amount of equity. Or in Kenny's case, if you go in there and buy a property that's failing and you repurpose it and get the, uh, the P&L turned around the right direction, you increase rents. Now, all of a sudden, you're able to take a cap rate on those increased rents. Therefore, you forced appreciation and you can not pay down the loan. You can borrow more money at a 75% LTV and take out all the money that you put down to secure the property 
and remodel it or, or repurpose it in the first place. Is that a strategy you've used in the past, Kenny? Yeah. And, and to your point, George, that's all tax-free money. So when you pull money out of real estate in the form of debt, let's say, it, you know, a lot of people call it a cash out refinance, that's tax-free. You, know, yeah, you, right. ta you don't pay tax on that because it's debt and you actually owe it back. So now on a, on a home that somebody owns, like you pointed out, and there's probably some people that are asking that question for that, mm -hmm. you, you know, what I, what I like to say is, you know, it depends on your situation personally. So right. if you're, if you're retiring, let's say, and you're on a fixed income, probably not a bad idea. Uh, but, but if you've got several, you know, buckets of money and you've got, you know, some side hustles going and you've got revenue coming in from multiple spots and, and, or you've got a bunch of reserves, then, um, I, I don't necessarily, uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily do that. And so, so kind of a rule of thumb for us is we like to have one year's mortgage payments reserve in escrow on all of our properties. So at all mm -hmm. times and, and the pandemic pretty much uh, made us realize that that was a good decision, you know, because yeah, we right. had, um, you know, we weren't sure what was going to go on with, with people that were paying. And so whether or not it's you paying your home mortgage or whether it's tenants paying us and us paying our mortgage, either way, we had, you know, some uncertainty. So, so as a company, we have one year's uh, reserve. And then, uh, you know, then I'm happy because I figure, well, from, from that point, you, at least you're covered for one year, you should be able to figure it out. Yeah. And I think that illustrates another great point on why Schumpeter's creative destruction is so important. And in this world of participation trophies, uh, we've created an environment where we don't let, not only do we not let little kids fail, but we don't let uh, big, huge corporations fail either. And the problem with that, and what Milton Friedman pointed out so many times, and uh, Jim Rogers has pointed this out as well, is that the loss component of profit and loss in a free market system is just as important as the actual profit from a standpoint of businesses that behave imprudently need to go out of business and be taken over by the people who made good decisions. So if we're talking, let's juxtap let's compare two people here. So we've got Kenny that's got a great secure capital structure. He's got all of these uh, reserves to cover his mortgage. Therefore, if we have a big downturn in the market, regardless of whether it's because of COVID or, or whatever else, he's in a position, he's got dry powder, he's not hurting because tenants aren't paying rent. He can go in and buy those assets from people that were over leveraged and took on too much risk and um, made bad decisions, really. And that therefore, all the productive assets go to the individuals who are making better decisions, you see. And that's why it's so important that we allow businesses and property owners to actually fail because the system becomes stronger as a result. But if we prop up everybody, then the Kennys of the world don't have as many opportunities. And therefore, we just, you get these zombie corporations and these zombie uh, uh, private equity funds that own all of these properties. And the system isn't as strong. And it's, in fact, it's, it's even more fragile than it was before. So I don't want to go off on a tangent, but I thought I'd point that out. Okay, let's look at another question here. Guys, if you do me a favor and start the comment with question. Oh, well, here, Wayne Smith wants your opinion, Kenny, on building materials. Do you think that they're ah. going to continue to go <laughs> up in price or do you think they're going to drop? The million dollar question. It's a good one. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you Especially what. For you. So, yeah. So we're building four properties right now. We have one under construction. We have three more land deals that, um, and so the issue we're having right now is you think about it, you know, we need prices from the subcontractors to be able to take, to go to the bank, to get a construction loan. 
Well, the subcontractors won't commit because if you're a concrete guy or a framer or, you know, whatever OSB, let's say, or whatever you are, you, you know, you don't want to commit to me because you don't know if the price by the time we build the property five, six, seven months later, let's say, or wherever your trade comes in, um, you know, you can commit. So we've got this chicken egg thing going on right now. And, and so it's really crazy. So on one project uh, we had, uh, our framing comp our framing bid just lumber alone was one million high one million so mm. uh, you know so we were able to bring that down a little bit uh, so to answer his question I do believe that prices are going to come down and they're going to start to normalize I really do because if you look at the disruption a lot of it had to do with this pandemic now we we don't have to go all down the rabbit holes as as to why on the on the sawmills and you know the trade between you know the, the the US and the other countries and all those kinds of things but the truth is a lot of the things that uh, you know we're having a tough time getting flooring we're having a tough time getting paint we're having a tough time getting appliances so all that stuff if if that doesn't point out to you guys that we are literally a global economy you know i don't know what will and so as yeah, things right. start to as things start to calm down then for sure we're going to start to see the prices kind of come back because all this happening right now is that uh, people are bidding for the scarcity and, you know, it's driving it up at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So the cure for high prices are still high prices. You yeah, got out exactly right. Yet. <laughs> right. That's it. That's right. Okay. So yeah. I'm back. <laughs> all right. So here's a question uh, for you guys. And uh, I, I think this could be very interesting. Carrie on Facebook is asking, what do you guys think of RV parks? Well, RV parks are mobile home parks. They are different. Yeah, the, the specific question is RV parks. Yeah, and RV parks, that's like running a business. Uh, I own a mobile home park, and we have a couple of RV spots in it. Um, but, you know, that's like nightly rentals, and so that's a lot more business complicated a lot more management like running a hotel versus an investment where you've got long-term rentals um kenny yeah. have you ever done anything in in mobile home parks and rv parks or anything yeah yeah we've done some and obviously we have, we have self storage too and, and we have obviously rvs uh at and they're not rv parks but we have rv storage but the uh, okay. and we do wine we've done wine storage too which is interesting which is a whole different topic which uh that, that might, one yeah, uh, he was you, you were telling me like about that, that. I, really that's interesting <laughs> um, yeah. but i will tell you this thing um you know I look at a lot of these things, cover mobile homes, RV, RV parks, as kind of covered land plays. And so for me, it all boils down to math. So, you know, if whatever you buy the land for and, you know, whatever the historical revenues have been minus the expenses, that pretty much tells you whether it's a good deal or a bad deal. So sometimes we've bought mobile home parks that might be on the edge of town because in the path of progress, Maybe later we can convert that to you know commercial shopping center, maybe a multifamily community or mm, something like that. So yeah, so it's like it's like um, that's why I call so it a just, covered land play. Yeah, so you're just cash flowing it while you wait for the land to appreciate to a point yeah. where you want to hit the bid. Yeah, because land doesn't that land doesn't cash flow as you know. So yeah, unless there's something on it. So um, now not to say that that's the only use for, you know, this RV park might, might be in a great spot. It might, you know, might be always full, might be next to a, let's say a national park, who knows, but you, you know, so uh, not all RV parks are created the same as you know, some will be out in the middle of the country and, and you know, some will be right across the street from, you know, the Yosemite, let's say. And, and, and so yeah. you, you have, you have to kind of look at them individually. Yeah, that's a good idea. You know, I never thought about that, Ken, how you look for a piece of land that's in the path of progress and then yeah. you to cash flow it because at that point in time, it's probably highly illiquid. Uh, you just put some sort of storage like RV storage or, um, yeah, I actually rent an RV storage space uh, in Tucson and uh, man, they have a huge lot there that now is all surrounded by residential. When they set it up, I would imagine it was probably out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, 
so that's how they all are. I was looking at a couple on the outside of Phoenix for the exact same thing. You, yeah. you know, the, the, the problem with land is it's really, truly just an expense. And, yeah, you know, cause, exactly. cause you have your property taxes and, you know, perhaps maybe some utilities or whatever that might be. Um, and, and, uh, and so what you're always looking for on any kind of land is how do I monetize the land? And, right. um, no, we, do we've done it with, it? yeah, we've done it with even billboards. So, you, huh. you know, like, like uh, a lot of the areas that you'll see stretch between say city to city, uh, you might have opportunities to put up billboards and you might maybe you make, you know, a couple grand per side per billboard, you, you know, so there are ways to do, uh, you know, land deals and, and not just have them as, you know, kind of an expense. A negative carry. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a great point. All right. Let's, uh, yeah, so shouldn't I just wait and hold my resources in precious metals until real estate bubble implodes? Ross, the, the, the problem there is you don't know real estate. I'm assuming you're talking about residential has to come down to its historic trend line. That that's, it, it just does. Uh, the, the problem with that is you don't know if it's going to come down in nominal terms or just adjusted for the rate of inflation. See, uh, the real estate bubble could implode by real estate prices going up. But they're just not going up as fast as the rate of inflation. So if you have your property or the property that you've got your eye on, uh, that you're waiting for the, the bubble to implode, it could go up 5% per year over the next 10 years. But if the rate of inflation is 10%, then it's still going to implode in terms of purchasing power, but the price is going to go up, the nominal price. <laughs> so it's uh, then you have to really answer the macro question as to whether or not you think we're going to have a deflationary deleveraging in the form of asset prices or an inflationary deleveraging. And that becomes a very difficult question to answer. It's a matter of probabilities. Uh, but it's it's very difficult to sit there and say, okay, real estate prices are at all time highs. Therefore, we're going to see something exactly like we saw in the GFC. So I'm just going to wait for that moment in time. Another thing that that makes it even more difficult is, and Kenny and I were discussing this the other day, real estate typically doesn't implode in the sense that it, it's it's not like the stock market where you wake up one day and it's 20% lower than it was the day prior looking at like Black Monday in 1987 as an example. Uh, look at the GFC. Uh, we peaked out in 2006 and real estate prices bottomed out in 2012. Six years later, six years. So even if we started, even if we had another GFC type of event, that would mean that prices won't uh, implode fully, if you want to look at it that way, until... Uh, 2027. So, and that's if prices started going down right now. <laughs> so th there's there's a lot of uh, dynamics there. And, another, and then lastly, what I'd say is, is be careful because what you're doing is you're trying to buy a dollar denominated asset uh, with, with holding something that can go up or down in value in terms of dollars. So th that... I'm not saying I don't like gold. I definitely do. And I think it's a great store of value. And I think everyone should own it 10% of the portfolio. But I don't know that it's a good strategy to hold gold until the dollar price of real estate goes down for the reasons I just mentioned. I don't know. Guys, do you have anything to add to that? I'm back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree with you, George. Uh, I, I think that, um, you know, Real estate, there's a lag with real estate. So, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to, you want to buy it from the bank after the banks held on to it for a while. That's the best time, you know, because they're frustrated. Right. It's a negative right. drag. It's, you know, it, it, it's called REO or real estate owned. When, when, a, when a bank is, has toxic assets that they've taken back from defaulted loans, that's not a good 
they they don't get a good rating and so you, they're they're very motivated to get that off the problem is is the you know depending on what they loaned it on you know they're going to take it back on their books for what they loaned it on and and so what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're not buying too early it's what i like to say you know don't try to catch a falling knife you know yeah, like right. let, let let the market you know, kind of drag it down to what it's supposed to be. And so we did this in 2010, 2011, you, you know, where, where banks were doing big write downs on their loans. And so, you know, it affects the bank's a share. So if you're, let's say you're a, you're a shareholder in the, in the bank during that time, that would have impacted you because it would have impacted the profitability of that bank as they were writing down the loans, but they're not motivated for a long time, you know, the bank's like, uh, you know, first of all, the seller's going to try not to default. And, and, right. and the last, and, and then the, if it does go to the bank, the bank's not going to just move the asset right away. It's going to try to sell it at the highest price. And then it's just going to have to make its, make its yeah. way. And, so and it's there's a better. big lag time in the pre foreclosure big, stage too. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. What you say. So, so to your point, George, it, you know, six years is, uh, it, it, you know, it, that could be, uh, I don't know if, if, if we use 2006 to 2008 as that time frame, you know, it could be easily that long again. Yeah. Kenny, were you doing real estate in the early 1990s? Yeah. You're, you're in the game right around then, weren't you? That's probably yes, when you I got, was. didn't we have a dip in, in real estate in the early 1990s or was that just in the east coast or was that more widespread well there there were a couple things that happened uh during that time frame i think uh one of them was the um dot com bust uh no i'm talking about another, the early 90s well, that was late like 90s all, right? all yeah. before yeah okay yeah yeah and then so in the late 90s i'm trying to think of what it was called but um i i can't i was on the west coast during the time yeah. but I yeah, I just know. remember Trump. I, I can tell you, SoCal had it. Yeah, and oh, and the, Trump's bankruptcy in New York and so forth. Yeah, that was in the early nineties, Jason. Um, I don't know. I remember so, hearing I mean, that had a, he had a couple. He had like two really rough spells, and I think one was the early nineties. I think you're right. Yeah, it's either yeah. early nineties or late eighties, something like that. I know there was a real downturn in the market. I didn't know if it was just uh, regional. Or I, or I guess it probably was just regional because, um, you know, that was the whole mantra in the middle 2000s is that real estate nationally had right. never gone down as far as price in, in nominal terms. Okay. I, I can definitely tell you that in the mid 90s, I was in real estate in Orange County, California, and uh, it was there was a pretty tough market in the mid 90s. For sure, hmm. yeah. at least in Orange so, County. Now that was when the Orange County bankruptcy, and you might recall the name Bob Citron, who uh, decided using the uh, the taxpayers' treasury money, it was good to speculate in derivatives with their money. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And Merrill so Lynch was right there that, helping them do it. <laughs> so, if we want to call that like a bear market, how long did that take to hit, hit the bottom? Oh gosh. I don't know. Um, was that three, you know, four but, years, but, or was it? But but to, to you know, I just want to expand on what Kenny was saying, and and that's you know one of the things that happens. Ken talked a lot about the way the banks operate, but we also have to look at, of course, the way all these individual sellers operate. And yeah, right. Sellers capitulate one at a time and capitulate slowly, right? So. They, they look at the neighbor's house and they always think, well, my house is better than the neighbor's. Somehow that's everybody's house is always better than their neighbor's. I don't know how that's possible, but it's, it's a psychological thing, right? And, uh, and, and so they think they got to sell it for more than them. And it just takes, you know, when sellers are pricing their home, uh, you know, in a down market, they're always looking in the rear view mirror. And mm -hmm. in the upside market, they're always looking out the shield in front, thinking, "Oh, it's going up more and more. I'll just wait." And so, right. uh, it's a it's just a funny psychology, you know. But what happens in the down market with that spiral is is people get caught chasing the market down, and mm -hmm. their houses become stale on the market, and everybody wonders, "Well, why isn't anyone buying this if it's been on the market so long?" And 
I, I remember, you know, when I was in traditional real estate, I had some listings that literally took a year to sell. It was absolutely crazy, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's. I, I see Burks in the in the comments here, Jason. Thanks for hanging out. He's a good buddy of ours, Jason yeah. Burrick, uh, with yeah. Wall Street from Main Street. And hey, Jason. By the way, Burke, I got to get you on the show, buddy. I, I, I'm just packed until, or I'm swamped until Rebel Capital is live. But probably sometime early July, get you back on the show. But he's got a question here. He says, "Can George, Ken, and Jason comment on how many of their friends with no stock market knowledge or experience are posting on social media about buying GameStop and AMC call options?" <laughs> I don't know. Not really a real estate question. I don't know, you go, I don't know yeah. if you guys have been following that. But yeah. uh, these meme stocks have well, exploded. A AMC, George. <laughs> that's yeah. A, that's the moneymaker. <laughs> that, that, they've exploded to the upside there. So basically, Jason Burke is trying to kind of uh, get some anecdotal evidence as to how many, how much hysteria there is with the, the retail market with people who have absolutely no clue about the stock market. But they just heard that this is a way to get rich. Yeah. So they're piling in and buying these call options. Do you guys have any buddies like that? That that or Bitcoin, just one. you know. Yeah. I just have one. It's called Reddit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, most of the, yeah, most of their buddies are real estate guys, Verick. So they, I don't think uh, they've got into that. But although I've got a couple buddies that um, I would use as, as proxies on hysteria. Let's just say it that way. And uh, they have not talked about GameStop and AMC, although they have talked a lot about Dogecoin or Dogecoin or the hell it's called. Yeah, so, whatever uh, it's called, right? So there and you I'd go. Rather own, I'd rather own the building that AMC leases from, by the way. So That's yeah. a good point, Ken. <laughs> I like that one. Yeah. The, the building the, is the, the most the, stable asset of all. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That stock is just a derivative. Yeah. That, that yeah. you know, hey, by the way, let's expand on that, Ken. That was a really good statement you just made. You know, the, the stock is a derivative of, of the real estate, right? Because AMC has to have the piece of real estate in order to operate. And so out of that piece of real estate that is, say, the, the real thing, if you will, I think that's what Ken's getting at, the derivative is the business. And mm -hmm. the derivative of the business is the stock. Right. Right. Uh, can you want to expand I, yeah, on that? At all? Yeah. I, what I like to tell people is, that, like, you could own the McDonald's building, right. or you could own the Mc, which is real estate, or you could own the McDonald's franchise, right. or you can own the McDonald's stock. <laughs> which mm -hmm. one's safest? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, yeah. It the all stock, just gets it, further and further. Yeah, it gets further and further from the core, from the source, and you know, if you think about it, folks. You always, it, when in any relationship, you write business deal, you always want to be as far up the food chain as possible, right? You know, so so that's what Ken is saying, right? The best thing is, and you ask Ray Kroc, right? Because we all saw the movie The Founder. Now everybody knows the story. Nowadays they didn't used to know it, but you know, it's it was all about the real estate, right? And then the secondary thing was the business, and mm -hmm. the third thing was the stock. Yeah. All right. Okay, so we've got REI Diaries. Question, I keep telling myself, invest for cash flow, but this is a crazy market slash economy. Are you guys profiting from inflation in the short term at all? Any yeah. short term flip? So what she, what they or she is, or he is saying is, uh, have you guys taken advantage of any of these extreme price moves and have been like, you know what, I'm a cash flow uh, investor, but I, this price or this property has gone up so much in value. I'm just going to go ahead and flip it and pocket the pocket, the money. I've well, sold some cars. No, it's truthful. Like, like, uh, you know, new cars aren't coming in. So some of my used cars have jumped. And so I'm like, man, yeah. It's time amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I actually have. I've sold so far three. I got another one. I'm selling. Uh, I'm going to sell another one, and and you know, and and I'm paying more than I'm getting more than I paid for on these on these used cars, uh, you know. So yes, uh, not into real estate because I I'm a holder, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm definitely profiting from inflation. Right. Yeah. And, and so, you, buddy? 
Yeah, you know, I haven't been flipping, but um, and I'm a buy and hold guy too. I am doing a uh, one ten thirty one exchange. I did four properties for two more expensive properties, which I usually go the opposite direction. By the way, this was weird. I just went the other way this time uh, with this exchange. But um, you know, even if you don't flip it, I you you make money because this is such a fast appreciating market and of course you can refi to get your cash out or you can just enjoy the wealth effect right you don't have to realize it necessarily uh you can just look at what's happening and and it's a a very pleasant uh time in that respect but the rents are lagging as they always do the rents always lag the appreciation yeah. and so uh rents are way behind Jason, you've got a strategy that I've heard you talk about before where you sell some of the properties in your portfolio that have gone up in price. Uh, in other words, the RV ratio has gone down. Right. And you parlay that equity into properties with better RV ratios. Yeah. It, and you want to I have... I usually do that, George. Uh, now this time I went the other direction. Pretty much every year I'll do an exchange or you know, mostly every year I think. Um, I'll do an exchange where I'll sell one highly appreciated property and I'll buy two in its place mm, and move to okay. an even more linear market. And I call that the two for one. A bunch of our clients do, we help clients do it all the time. Sometimes they get a three for one, um, mm. but you know, this time around, it was kind of weird. I, I sold four properties and I only bought two. I, I just bought more expensive, higher quality properties this time. I, I don't know. I just did something different, <laughs> but I usually yeah. do exactly that. But yeah. yeah, but the bottom line is that may be a, a good strategy that you might want to consider. Uh, REI Diaries is if you've got some properties, maybe sell the ones where the RV ratio as uh, not in terms of your cost basis, but in terms of the comps uh, have, have gotten low and then parlay that into maybe another market that has a better RV ratio. Uh, as an example, I know Hartman uh, has gone into with his clients, I believe Denver at one point in time, didn't you? A long time ago. Denver's way too expensive now. It, yeah, you but can't see, my, point, work. But my yeah. point is uh, if you had clients that went into yeah. Denver, you know, those prices would have really, really gone up. Oh, and yeah. that would have given you an opportunity to cash out, take that equity, and go into a Little Rock, Arkansas, or right. Uh, right. A, an Indianapolis, or something like that, where you're taking that gain and taking it out where there's a lot more downside because that market has turned into like a hybrid cyclical market, and then put that equity in a market that's got less downside because it's more linear, and you're getting right. a higher cash flow per your equity. George, you wouldn't believe this, and I, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but in 2004, 2005, 2006, uh, you know, I was helping people buy properties in Austin, Texas, and, no. and you know, you, you yeah. couldn't touch Austin today, um, and then, you know, Denver, probably the last property we sold in Denver was maybe 2013, possibly, mm -hmm. right around yeah. there, and the, these markets, they all just get too expensive, and then you need to do... Uh, you know, like what I call the water theory right now. This isn't water. It's uh, Remy Martin. Okay. <laughs> you notice I brought the whole bottle with me just in case I want a refill. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, but if you, if you, if you spill this, right, it's going to seek its lowest point, right? That's what the liquid is always going to do. Go to the lowest point and money kind of does the same thing. And I bet Ken has noticed this or actually done this himself, right? Uh, where one market will just be too expensive and you need to wait for the rents in that market to catch up with the prices. And that, that takes a few years, usually maybe three years for that, the rents to catch up. And, um, uh, but you go into another market where the prices are lower. You do a 1031 tax deferred exchange. You have no tax, tax consequence. And, um, it, it, it really is nice, you know, typically on that two for one deal, uh, and these are just little single family homes, not big apartments like Ken, Ken is working with. Uh, you know, our, our, our people will typically uh, triple their cash flow. They'll go from like $200 a month positive cash flow to maybe $600 a month positive cash flow. And they'll have two properties instead of one property. And then those will start that appreciation cycle and they do it again. You know, it's uh, 
it, it, it works, you know, it's, a, it's, a, you know, there's that old saying, most people overestimate what they can do in a year, but they right, underestimate right. what they can do in five years. And yeah, that, right. that's Very so true. true of real estate. True of everything. Yeah. You know, I, I asked this question in a way to Kenny the other day when, when we were doing an interview and I, I'd like to get your take on it. So on this topic of, of selling something and parlaying that equity into, uh, a, a a property in an area that has more upside or has better risk reward. Would you sell a property based on the laws changing for landlord tenants and, or would you sell a property because you thought that, um, you know, there could be more social unrest in those areas that you just don't want to deal with maybe because they're in a blue state instead of a red state. Yeah, well, yeah. it's happening right now. It's it's definitely happening. We're 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 seeing a flood. Yeah, I'm in Arizona, and I know you guys are in Florida, but you guys are probably seeing a flood of people, ten thirty ones, and they're coming in from you know California, Washington, right now into into Arizona like crazy, and uh, that's what's going on in Texas, as you know. Uh, you, you know, big names like like. Um, Musk, uh, you know, are relocating to Austin from California. So that's not new news. But the, the truth is, that's not good for, you, you know, when, when you have that's happening all over the place with people's names that you would never know. And we're starting to see that now, George, a lot. Yeah, but would that prompt you? Would something like, let's say you had a property that hadn't appreciated, let's say you had a property in Chicago. Yeah. And uh, it hadn't appreciated that much, but you'd made a bit of money. And it was a good cash flowing property. But you said to yourself, you know what? I just don't like the direction that the politics are going here. I see it as a potential hotbed for social unrest moving forward. Or maybe uh, you don't see it as a potential hotbed for social unrest, but maybe they change the landlord laws to really, 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 really favor the tenant. And then you're like, okay, I, I need to get the heck out of here and take this equity and move it somewhere where it's going to be treated better. Have you guys yeah, ever I'll, I'll, had that? Yeah, I'll give, you a, I'll, I'll give you a real example and I'll just pick on Oregon for a moment. So I did a big project in Portland and, you know, and to, you know, what we're seeing right now is affordability issues all over. And yeah. so different cities and different states are handling it differently. But Oregon decided to do a statewide rent control, which basically means that, you know, they're going to regulate what you can do if, as a landlord. Mm, but on the, right. other, on, the, on the other side of that, they're also looking at the landlord or the real estate owner as the one that can pay higher property taxes. So, you know, so they're, they're jacking your expenses and they're capping your income. And right. so, you know, so anybody is not going to want that kind of control if they're a real estate investor, uh, as an example. So yes, the answer is we moved out of Oregon, uh, because of, you know, the, the laws and the things that we saw. And obviously we're, you know, we're buying properties uh, to make ourselves and our investors a profit, just like a lot of people are. And that's the way it works. And so cities do these kinds of things and it's their right to do them. And, but the landlord, of course, like, or the real estate investor also has a choice. Like they could yeah, they right. go wherever they want. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Jason? What type of experience do you have in that? Have you moved your equity somewhere where it's going to be treated better? Well, you know, George, I, I love the point that you're alluding to. The old, the old saying, money always goes where it's treated best, right? That's right. It, That's it's, right. A, it's a great thing. And, you know, if, if you look at this, this is really the um, the same thing that multinational corporations think about. And mm -hmm. you hear them say this on the news. They call it political risk. Right. There's right. political risk. Uh, you know, if you if you want to open up a, a, a plant or an oil refinery in, say, Venezuela, right, <laughs> years ago, and then and then your your whole plant, your refinery is nationalized. The government just comes in with, you know, uh, soldiers and they take it over and they say, hey, look, sorry, it's ours. Leave, you know, and uh, and that and that's what happens. And and I, I've definitely done that. I left the Socialist Republic of California 10 years ago. And I moved to Arizona for six years, 
And, uh, you know, I just kept moving uh, till my tax rate went to zero on a state level. <laughs> and now I'm in Florida. <laughs> and and yeah. I remember, I remember, yeah. Ken, um, the, the day I moved to Arizona 10 years ago, and I remember crossing that state line and seeing the sign, Welcome to Arizona, right? You, you've, I'm sure, been across that line many times. Yeah. And, and I thought, my state taxes, my state income taxes just dropped by 69%. That was yeah. the difference at the time between California and Arizona on state taxes. That's huge, huge, mm. not to mention the other cost of living, right? Uh, everything else. Yeah. So so, yeah. Have, well, a couple questions here quickly. Jason, number one, I saw uh, thoughts on Jacksonville, and I think you've done some homework there. What, what, are your, yeah. uh, what are your thoughts there really quick? Jacksonville is the largest city in America geographically, and we've had many, many investors buy in Jacksonville. Uh, we like it. It's a it's a great market for rental properties. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, we're, we're we're fans of Jacksonville. Uh, we don't have much in the way of most of our our focus uh, lately has been leaning toward new construction properties, and so we're not doing as much business in Jacksonville as we used to. But I still think that's a fine market wrong with Jacksonville. It's, yeah. it's not, it hasn't become hybrid, meaning when we look at the three types of markets, linear markets, cyclical markets, hybrid markets, cyclical being the expensive markets, West Coast, expensive Northeast, Miami, uh, Fort Lauderdale, those are cyclical. Um, most of the world, most of the country being linear, the Midwest, the Southeast, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, but a lot of these markets are becoming hybrid as they sort of get crazy and appreciate a lot. Atlanta, is definitely now a hybrid market. Yeah, um, right. So it's it's in the category of Denver, Phoenix, you know. Yeah, yeah so we, we've got a question here from Unicorn Farting Glittering Rainbows. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> the creativity is great. Yeah, By the yeah, way, I, actually, I, that's I, my I, new name. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it can yeah, be careful we'll what go, you wish we'll for. Go with UFGR as a <laughs> as an abbreviation, but uh, no, they actually don't have a question. I just wanted to say their name out loud because I thought it was hilarious. Uh, but another question that I saw is, um, "What do you guys think of farmland?" Oh, I got an opinion on that. Ken, you want to go first? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I actually, um, I have a. I actually did a podcast with a good friend of mine that does this for a living up in the Washington state area. I was up there and um, you know, it's, it's definitely more complicated than you think, but I will tell you what he's done is he's gone and bought farmland that had chickpeas on it uh, to mm. expand his organ, his organization, which is basically hummus. He's a hummus provider and and he's done very very well so he pays the farmer a fixed price he gets the crop and um but but uh, you know i know this much about it but there's a great podcast that i did uh, that i think can explain a lot because i said to him what are some things that people should ask if they're doing farmland and he had a whole bunch of stuff so just go to the, my youtube his name's phil heinrich and um, mm. HTC trading, and it's a very, very, very good podcast. But I would, I would annihilate what he said if I just tried to wing it. Yeah, good stuff. What uh, do you guys think of? Uh, we got a question from Da G himself. So, what do you guys think of Honolulu, Hawaii, with its finite amount of land? Do you see it being affected if the market has a correction? Way too expensive. Yeah. Ken. Yeah. Well, if you look on uh, blackknight.com, which is, you know, monitors the forbearance, uh, it's one of the, one of the, uh, you should go there and take a look and you can kind of see um, Hawaii is on the top of the list for defaults. So there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of defaults right now in Hawaii. Now, yeah. uh, obviously Hon Honolulu being the biggest city in Hawaii, I'm a massive fan of Hawaii, but um uh, you know, it's interesting because what's going on there is for the and which could happen in the United States is there's 
three generations living in a lot of the households. So you have the grandparents, the parents and the kids, which is very unique there. And that's because of the affordability issues. And it's been that way for quite some time. So mm. I'm not sure what uh, right now. It's a, I, I think Hawaii is a winner of, over the long haul, of course. But again, it just depends on where and how much you pay. And, you know, if anybody wants it after you buy it. Right. Yeah, I think that that's really a market for investors who are more about appreciation and less about cash flow. And personally, I don't think that's a, a good way to uh, invest in real estate or anything for that matter. Uh, yeah. so that's, that's why I don't really uh, like it. That's, that's not investing, that's speculation. Hey, yeah, George, I agree. just a, a, a quick comment on the farmland thing. I just wanted to throw my two cents in on that. So we've looked at that a bunch of times over the years. And um, conceptually, farmland is great, right? Mm -hmm. Because people will always need food and farming is super important. Of course, it's very important. But, you know, I, I just, you know, we have a client who does financing for farmland and I, I talk to him from time to time and, uh, you know, the yield just, it's so low on, on farmland, you know, now yeah, right. we've obviously got uh, Bill Gates, uh, the evil Dr. Evil Bill Gates, right? <laughs> uh, buying up farmland like crazy. I don't know what's up his sleeve. Anything you can monopolize that's needed is probably going to be a great deal, right? But for the rest of the people, I, I just think the yield on farmland is just so low, you know, uh, it just doesn't doesn't really work, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Kenny, here's a question. Are you taking LPs? This person says, if so, how to get in touch? Yeah. Thanks, George. Uh, yeah. So just go to KenMacro.com and you can follow the investment portal. We, we, we have... Um, uh, we just put a deal out and it's high net worth accredited. That's, uh, as you guys know, uh, we, we just, we just funded one. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, what's interesting. You'll love this. One of our investors on that deal, Jason, mm -hmm. um, it was, a, it was a woman. She's like, I'm accredited. I can't wait. I'm going to invest. Da, da, da. Then she, right before she had to fund, she called and said, well, I was in crypto and I'm not accredited oh. anymore. <laughs> so, oh, so, no. So she went, yeah. What she went from, you know, so that's, you know, kind of going back to that earlier comment with you, George, like things do go up and go down and be very, very yeah. careful. And you're not, you're not going to be able to time it. So I felt bad for her, but uh, it does happen. But we do take accredited at KenMacroy.com. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and folks to, to that point that Ken made, you know, speculate 5%, maybe 10 of your net worth, depending on how much your net worth is. You can do your Bitcoin. You can do uh, even gold might be a little speculative, I think. I don't know. George might disagree with me on that. But, you know, the core of your assets should be things that produce income. My definition of an investment is if it doesn't produce income, it's not an investment. It's right. just a speculation. On it. That's how right. I do it. Yeah. Yeah. I love the way you say it, George. It's great. Okay. Let's see here. We had how many people are watching, George? 1,070. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. Well, hello, 1,100 people. Yeah. And then we've got more on, on Facebook, too. Uh, so that's yeah. Uh, thank, thanks, guys. That. Thanks. Uh, thanks for taking your time today. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Man, I had a question thanks right for here. Thanks for joining us. Thing skipped. Uh, I hate it when it skips like that. Storage units. All right. Well, well, let's go with this one. Kenny, I know you've got a lot of experience in uh, storage units. So what are your uh, you know, hot tips or what are the things to maybe look out for uh, when sure. someone's considering a storage unit facility? Yeah. So here's the thing. Uh, we own some. Uh, so... I do have a uh, experience with this. In fact, I was just talking with my partner an hour ago, right before here on, on one that we have in Corpus Christi is 650 units. Um, the thing about storage is it, it's a, um, it, it's very testy. So in other words, if there's a lot of storage facilities in the area to a smaller area, you're always, you're not gonna be able to move the needle on vacancy. And because, um, you know, what happens is like an eight by 10 or a 10 by 10 or, you know, the actual unit itself is kind of fixed. 
Um, you know, and, and if, if the place across the street lowers it by five or 10 bucks then you kind of have to do the same thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's really, they're really, really testy. And, um, you know, the, the other thing is you're not going to find a lot of value add in a storage facility. Mm -hmm. So you, when you buy it, it's not like you can, you know, upgrade the flooring and the paint and, you know, all the stuff that we do in our apartments, you know, people, people are looking, you know, for a storage unit, they want safe, clean, you know, all those things, but they also want it to be very, very, uh, they're price sensitive. So they're great mailbox money. So don't get me wrong. If you buy them right and they're full and they're in an area where there's not a lot of competition, you're going to love that thing. But, um, you, you know, again, it's just math uh, on the income and the expenses and, and all the expenses are different based on property taxes and insurance rates. Like my Corpus Christi, uh, my Corpus Christi property, uh, you know, we went through a hurricane already, you know, and, and mm -hmm. so our insurance, our insurance rates are higher. Oddly enough, we weren't that property wasn't wasn't impacted. And so we immediately had 200 FEMA uh, clients, you know, from all the people that were. Oh. So, so oh, that, wow. that was great news then, right, Ken? Yeah, but then they moved, uh, you know, a year, year, a year to a year and a half later. So, right. you know, it was temporary. It was great for us. Don't yeah. get me wrong. And, uh, uh -huh. and and so, but they are testy. And so you just got to make sure there's not a lot of competition. Yeah. So, so Jason, sorry about putting that over your face there, but I just wanted to do that so I wouldn't lose the question. Sure. Um, this was the one I was looking for. What do you guys think of Airbnb? Um. Well, I think it's uh, it could it can be great. Uh, I think a, it might be getting oversupplied, and um, it's definitely much more active management. No question about yeah. it. But uh, you know, and there's a lot of different things you can do in the Airbnb world, right? And also, you know, remember you said Airbnb, not short-term rental, which is interesting. You know, that's like Kleenex, Coke, etc. Now, uh, but you know, you're dependent on one platform mostly because vrbo is nothing compared to airbnb right and you know airbnb deplatforms people just like amazon does and facebook and google and everybody else so there's definite political risk as we were talking about earlier mm -hmm. yeah. there uh, so you know uh, make sure you have a plan b that, that's what i'd say um but uh but yeah, it's uh, it can be great. I have a lot of friends that do very well with Airbnb type properties, and um, uh, you know I'm sure Ken does as well. Yeah, I would yeah. just add a couple things. The, the number one is you don't want if you're buying something, you want to make sure that that's not your only that you you, you know that it cash flows if you have to rent it long term. So uh, if mm. if you're buying something based on the Airbnb revenue, be very very yeah, careful. Right. The other thing is municipalities and HOAs are cracking down on these oh, yeah. and, and they don't like them. So, so, you know, and so be very, make sure that you, you know, cause you could buy something and base it on that kind of revenue. And then like, um, like this, I know that the, uh, the city of Mon Santa Monica just said that the, the, um, the investor has to be living on the property. They have to have a business license and, uh, you know, there's all they're starting to put all these regulations in on the actual host or the Airbnb owner. Right. So there's all kinds of things happening around Airbnb. And also we're also it's also heading into a bad time because hotels are starting to open back up. So Airbnb right. had a really nice run during the pandemic because uh, people were looking for places to go. And so there's a prediction that the stock price is actually going to take a dip. In fact, Carl Icahn is doing a big short. Yeah, I read a whole thing on it um, on, on, um, on some malls. And, and, and uh, I think he said also Airbnb because he thinks that it's going to take a hit as these, as these resorts and hotels open back up. And, and and so what you know what's happening there is the price pressure of the hotels and resorts will you know they'll they'll be offering very good incentives to attract guests and everybody's going to weigh the option should I rent this Airbnb or should I just get a hotel right and uh, yep. and they're going to weigh that option. One more thing I've noticed on the Airbnb we we only do uh, the short term rentals in one market St Augustine Florida. And the thing I've noticed uh, of all my friends that do them, and you know, I've spoken at a few other mastermind groups and stuff, and 
the Airbnbs where people can uh, drive within four hours of a major city and they can have a truly different experience that's unique. For example, if they live in Atlanta and they can go to a beach town and have a really different experience and feel like they're on vacation without getting putting the whole family on a plane and, uh, you know, uh, that those have done really well, but um, the short-term rentals where they're needing to fly to them have suffered more. Obviously, mm. high-rise condos have suffered more. Uh, so it's it's like many things. It's spotty, you know. Yeah, right. You know? Yeah. Makes a lot of sense, Kenny. Question directed toward you: uh, Just basically, what are your tips to go into commercial real estate? Uh, they they kind of are hinting that you know what's the right time to get into commercial real estate, but I think uh, you you would say it depends on the deal, uh, not necessarily yeah. the time frame. But what are some tips there for a beginner? Yeah, well, it's a great question, and 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 so first of all, I just want to point out, like Jason likes to say about res- you know the housing market, you know the commercial mark commercial r- real estate can be industrial, it can be re- retail, it can be warehouse, it can be office, it can be multifamily. multifamily right? Yeah, so there's you know there's a lot in that category, and and then of course inside of there you have class A, class B, class C. And then you yeah, have right. location and then you have markets and you have sub markets. So there's a lot to consider and, and different price right. segments. <laughs> yes. And different yeah. price segments. So what I always tell people, it's no different than on the residential side is you want to go to where the market's going. So one of the reasons that we're investing in uh, right now, we're, we're, we're looking at Houston, Texas pretty hard is because a lot of people are moving there because of affordability and the weather and there's lots of jobs and specifically we're around the Texas medical center. And, and, you know, of course that stayed open during the pandemic and, and that whole area is continuing to grow and be vibrant. And so you want to be in areas that are going to be, you know, have really good population and employment growth. And, and so, and so it really doesn't matter then at that point, that could be a self-storage unit, that could be a retail center, that could be a multifamily. You, you know, if a lot of people are going to an area, what it does is it puts a lot of pressure on, you know, on, on, on certain kinds of real estate. So you got to, uh, so that would be my tip. Make sure that you're out ahead and you're not trying to be a pioneer in an area. Yeah. All right. So we've got a question from Matt. Uh, probably directed more towards Jason, maybe not. With rents lagging, how do you analyze single family homes to rent? How do you add to portfolio with current high real estate values comparing multifamily income based valuation versus one to four unit comps? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. good. That, so do you guys understand that question? Yeah, I think so. You know, it's a good, good okay. question. Um, and uh, what is that bottle Kenny's got now <laughs> over there? <laughs> you go from Coors Light to... Yeah, you went from Coors Light to... Uh, did you fancy it up? Because I, I got fancy here. Well, I <laughs> saw what you had and I was like, you know, I better up my game here. <laughs> I love it. George, where's your stiff drink? Uh, I don't know. Anything. I'm just in the hotel and I just got in before the, the live stream. So I don't have any time. I've just got this water. Oh, darn. Okay. Well, George is being healthy. Yeah. It looks like Absolutely. a stiff drink, but it's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's good for you. But, um, you know, to answer the question, uh, I, I just think that um, y- you, it, first of all, you want to be investing in a linear or maybe a hybrid market. So when you say overvalued market, I mean, you're probably mostly looking at those cyclical markets that are really frothy and in bubble territory for sure. So be careful of those. Um, And, uh, you know, in in our markets, I mean, the prices have definitely gone up, but the interest rates are so low that the deals still make pretty good sense. Not as good as they did last year, uh, but still pretty good. And um, you've just got to be willing to take a little bit uh, less on the cash flow side right now and be a little bit more of an, an, an appreciation investor. And I think that's warranted for maybe another two years. Uh, this can't last forever, obviously. When rates go up, you know, it's, it's going to definitely uh, shrink this craziness in the market. Uh, but, um, 
you know, I, I think everybody's going to be pretty, pretty good bet for, for two years or so. Um, and Ken, I think, is uh, not as bullish as I am. Uh, Ken, what's your latest, though? I mean, are you uh, yeah, chime in on that? Are, are well, you are you wait, are you think the crash is coming in July? <laughs> no, gosh, no. But I, 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 you know, it depends if the um, you know administration comes out with a lot more cash for people. You know, that's kind of what's delayed all of this. And, and you know, the the fact that uh, a landlord can't um, remove a, a tenant that's not paying, and 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 of course we have the you know the same issue on on the mortgage forbearance piece. So, so and then we have the the money, the unemployment, and all that kind of stuff. So, all of that got kind of kicked down the road, as you guys know. And 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 I think actually it was a good thing. I mean, you know, who wants a, a lot of people to be displaced out of their homes? You know, when the government says, okay, time to time to shut down. Um, and so, but, but now I, I do believe with the vaccinations where they are and, and, and all the, the places starting to reopen, I really do believe that we're going to see the end, um, at, at the end of this month. And I think some of the forbearance might trickle over. I've read, uh, some of the banks are working with people through, through the year. Uh, but I do think you know, the rising prices in houses have been very good for people because if they're delinquent, let's say they haven't been paying their mortgage and they've gotten this appreciation, the issue that they're going to have is do they qualify for a new loan or a modification or a refinance or whatever you want to call it? And if they don't, you know, they're going to have to pay that and they're going to have to do it through listing their house. And I think that's going to lag you know, in different markets over a period of time. And I, and I think it's going to be largely dependent on, you, you know, if you can go right back to the data, I'm a, it's kind of like, you know, is there a housing crash or, you know, how's housing doing? You know, you have to kind of go right down to the sub market, like, um, mm -hmm. you know, a specific uh, county, a specific city and, and take a look at the data and look at the defaults. And those are largely um, around, you know, the, 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 what was going on in that particular market, you, you know, like, like where you guys are when you shut down the tourism and you shut down the cruise ships, you shut down, you know, some of those things, it affects the, you know, the folks and, and, and their ability to pay. So, um, and so I think you're going to see little areas and little pockets that'll be, um, you know, we'll have a lot of supply and I think other areas will, will not be. Yeah. Here's a question that's, uh, written to me, but I, I'd like to get your guys' take on it here. I think I, I pretty much know the answer, but I think people learn a lot by hearing uh, you guys think through this question. It says, hi, George. I purchased a condo about five months ago. It still is getting built. So I guess maybe pre-construction, <laughs> but has already increased in value by 70000 Should I sell immediately? Well, why did you buy it in the first place would be my question. Was it yeah. to move in? Um, if it's a high-rise condo, I am definitely not a fan of high-rise condos. I do like them to live in. I'd rent one. I rented a beautiful one in in uh, Phoenix when I lived there. And, um, you know, I, I love them. The great views and the sexiness, they're awesome. But uh, they, they just, you know, they have very high association fees. Um, very controlled, very risky. If the HOA gets into a lawsuit, the financing can just evaporate. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, third party risk in condos in general, but especially high rise condos. So I, I, I like single family homes the best. Ken? Yeah. So if it were you personally, not that you're giving yeah. advice to this guy, but if you were in the same situation, you'd probably take the 70 grand profit and, and, move on to a, a single family home where you've got a little bit more control of the asset from just strictly a financial point of view i'd probably say yes to that i mean i obviously don't know the circumstances it's a 70 grand profit on a hundred thousand dollar property or 70 grand profit on a million dollar property right like it makes a difference there right <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah so you know there you just with these questions you just never have enough detail to really know but, yeah, um, yeah you know by and large I'm not a condo fan, especially high rise condos. Yeah. Kenny, what if do you think? If it feels good enough, anything can work, but you know, it's not going to be my first. Yeah, I, I'm with Jason. The first thing I thought of was it, it probably cost the builder. The reason it's not done is because they can't get materials. And the second yeah. one is 
that, um, you know, it probably cost that condo was probably 20 or $30,000 more for the builder than, it, than uh, when they originally sold it to them. So hopefully they hedged the price because uh, mm -hmm. a lot of builders right now aren't doing that. They're saying, we'll give you a price at the end. Uh, uh, you know, they're saying you can, you, you know, give us a deposit and then you can decide. But if they have hedged the price and it really truly has gone up that much. And to Jason's point, if it's um, you know, a significant part of the down, uh, I mean, of the price, then then probably makes sense. You, you know, the problem is going to be what do you what do you buy then? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right relative to other choices in that same market yeah mm -hmm. and don't forget you got a capital gains uh, you have a capital gains tax you have a you know, probably some real estate commissions in there right um, you know uh, and, and some other things so it's not a 70 net it's going to be right. probably you know uh significantly less yeah that's that's true because you know with uh one of the things uh, that ken alluded to there is interesting um when when there is a high cost of buying and selling as there is in real estate most people would think that's a disadvantage and you know i i can see that side of it for sure trading a stock could be free or 20 bucks right um but uh with the real estate that's what makes it move more slowly it makes it more illiquid and that illiquidity reduces volatility. Liquidity creates more volatility. Look at stocks, Bitcoin, very liquid, extremely liquid. Mm -hmm. People can trade fast with a click of a mouse mm -hmm. and those prices reflect that. With real estate, illiquid, expensive trading costs. Yeah. yeah, and it creates inefficiencies that for the experienced yeah. real estate investor, they can take advantage of. Right, yeah, yep. it's not a perfect <clears throat> market, you know, and yeah, right. that's, that's the old random walk down Wall Street concept, right? Is that the market is more intelligent than any single player in the market. Mm -hmm. And 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 with with real estate, that isn't true. And that's what's good about it, is like because George you're says, there's with inefficiencies. Yeah. At the yeah. end of the day. I mean, it is the market, but it's just you, the buyer, and the seller. And if they like you, yeah. Yeah. they could give you a deal for a hundred grand less than what they give someone else you just never know where yeah. if you're buying gold uh it's going to be very difficult to buy gold for 50 percent less than where it's trading uh, at spot during during that given day okay yeah. uh, so here's a question for ken but i'd like to kind of make it more general and get your guys's view on this it says hi ken looking into buying a studio in arlington virginia where amazon headquarters looks like number two or something will be coming should I wait for eviction moratorium to end uh, before invest? So I think maybe the broader question or I'd like to get your guys' thoughts on is how do you, how much does that go into your decision-making process when you're buying either commercial or residential? And what I'm talking about is like this big, huge macro trend where there's a giant employer that's going into the market and you know they're setting up shop there. So would that motivate you to buy properties around that big employer? Or do you think that's already priced into the market? Or how do you guys usually look at that? Ken, you want to go first on that one? Sure. Um, so yes, it's priced in. A a a what happens is when Amazon announces that they're going to go somewhere, you know, and I did this in Austin, Texas uh, with Amazon as an example, you, you know, it's well known way before there, you know, and sometimes they're even building something. It, typically they're, you know, building a building and putting their name on it. And um, the, and also what I found is some of these distribution centers don't have the amount of employees like you think, you know, they're massive in size. They're robotic. But they, yeah. 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 So, so they're not quite what you would think, you know, as you drive by, you're like, Oh my gosh, that must have a lot of employees in there. It's not necessarily the case because of the technology that Amazon's using. But in, in this particular case in Austin, I think it's a call center where, you, you know, there's a lot more folks. And so, yes, what happens immediately when anything, when a, um, let's, it could be a, a football stadium. It could be a, like state farm just, uh, just did regional headquarters in Phoenix and in, in Richardson, Texas. 
Texas as an example, and they announced years ahead and they built these campuses. Well, well, all the real estate in the area and all the brokers and everybody was saying, hey, you know, this is where State Farm's going to be. There's going to be 15,000 jobs or whatever it is. And, and I personally bought some property uh, across the street from USAA in uh, San Antonio for this exact reason. So yes, it's definitely a thing. You definitely want that kind of, a, you know, stable um, employer there because it'll continually have, just like anything, it's going to continually have a flow of a demand of, you know, somebody who might rent. Mm, yeah. So okay. My, my thought on that is that, yeah. uh, you know, you got to be careful. Big employers can change their mind. We saw that happen with one of the Amazon um, uh, facilities and, uh, you know, in, until they're established and uh, unless they're a manufacturing company that is really rooted there where it's very expensive to move, uh, you know, an office space, they can get up and move really easily. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they've got political risk too, right? So that when they don't like the political environment, those companies get up and leave. We see this happening in New York and California for sure, right? And, yeah. Uh, but but if they're an auto manufacturer or FedEx in Memphis, right, they're not easily moving. That's just very difficult to move all that heavy equipment. But moving a bunch of people in cubicles at desk, pretty easy, right? Yeah. Here, here's another question. We got Ken. Do you foresee future for existing commercial slash retail? being repurposed into affordable housing. Yes, it's already happening. And, and you know, uh, we're already seeing that. So we're seeing people, actually there's funds, people are raising money right now for funds to actually convert office buildings to multifamily, uh, convert hotels to multifamily. Uh, we're starting to see retail Typically, what we're seeing right now is people are looking at, re I've had numerous conversations on this issue where what we would go in and do is actually, we would scrape uh, the whole project. So, you know, let's, it's, it, if it's, let's say an unanchored uh, retail center, which means that let's say there's not a safe way in there, or there's not an, you know, a, a big, big draw or people are coming and going and, and you're like, you got a water store, maybe a, a martial arts studio and, you know, uh, a beauty shop or something, you know, those little businesses, they thrive on the bigger business. And so a non anchored grocery store, when, when they leave a center that can kill a lot of those smaller businesses. And so you can buy those centers, and typically um, you can repurpose them into some other things. I've seen all kinds of things and um, it's happening right now with malls. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, there's a, there's a big malls happening all over the United States right now where malls are dying and, you know, people aren't going into them and the rents are high and they're shopping online, et cetera, et cetera. So a little bit different reason, but those typically those malls are extremely well located. So we're starting to see redevelopment opportunities all over the United States uh, for all those kinds of reasons. Okay. Let's see here. So a lot of those, while you're looking, George, just uh, let me know when you're ready. But uh, it's yeah. interesting because the shopping malls, uh, if they don't scrape them, they the easiest redevelopment there is to office space, right, Ken? And for, yep. uh, for the hotels, they can be really low-end apartments because they're obviously small, right? But office to residential mm. is a pretty tough conversion, I think, right? Because for sure, you know, there's they, they got to do all those bathrooms and kitchens. You know, that plumbing mm. is just super expensive. Yeah, right. It's um, a good point. And, yeah, so it's uh, a lot of times, like you say, it's just you know, it's just the land. It's a land play. They just scrape them, right? I don't know if you've seen this, George, but in New York, it's just Google this. Uh, there's nine hotels, um, you know, not far out of Manhattan that they uh, the city took over and turned into homeless shelters. And that's also happened in other parts of the country. And so you're starting to see that now pop up where, you know, some of these hotels that maybe have been vacant during COVID or during a pandemic or, or maybe you know, partially occupied, but anyway, they're hurting. Uh, some of these, uh, you know, some of those are already starting to, to, 
to repurpose into something different. Yeah, that's, I mean, that, that's sign of the times, isn't it? That's unfortunate. It is. Um, it it's is. a great learning lesson on how to repurpose, but, um, and when we, when we've got such a massive homeless problem, the, the bigger question is why do we have such a massive homeless homelessness problem? It's it's just bad policy all the way through that's created that problem, right? Yeah, yep. it's it's the government and the Fed distorting the market, and unfortunately, yep. they've painted themselves into a corner. They being the central planners, where the only thing that they can do is exacerbate the problem, because the only way to continue to inflate the bubbles which the economy has been built on is to continue QE, continue uh, deficit spending, which distorts the economy even more, which creates uh, more of the wealth gap, which, uh, you know, creates more homelessness and yeah. it creates more despair and uh, a lot of these unintended consequences that unfortunately we're going to see a lot more of uh, mm -hmm. most likely. I hope we don't but uh, most likely over the next uh, few years. And, you know, I just, uh, I just go back to when I was, you know, growing up in like the eighties or, you know, even in the nineties to, to think that they would take uh, that, you know, California and Oregon and I guess New York, I didn't even know about that there to, to think that they were, would take all these hotels and repurpose them or have a need to repurpose them to homeless shelters is just, I, I I just and some of these, I'd see that, yeah. you know, some of these are high end hotels, too. Uh, but but George, even though their policies, the policies of the central planners are uh, fail every time in every place they're tried. Right. Uh, just remember, the central planners always get richer. <laughs> yeah. so, that's who they're really planning for. I know yeah. that I was reading like in L.A., they had. Uh, uh, this would have been back in the late nineties, George, they, they said, okay, we had a homeless problem. And they, they, they did a, I think a, over a $1 billion bond offering, right. To do 10,000 apartments. And it just, the, you just read the article. It's just beyond belief. What, how, yeah. how yeah. messed up that whole thing uh, was And the average cost. Uh, and when it was all done, the average cost of the each home was $700,000 in construction yeah. costs as a result of fees and lawyers and all the bureaucracy and, and corruption just outright yeah, corruption yeah yeah cronyism that, that's uh, yeah. that's very well documented and that you know that happened you know from the last cycle and so hopefully that doesn't happen again there's a real need there's some people really in pain uh it's horrible to watch and uh you know it's it's a, you know uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the next couple of years yeah and also, too, it's 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 just a perfect example of the government trying to, uh, you know, they're, they're just looking at the surface problem and trying to fix that, which will create, in my opinion, more unintended consequences. And what I mean is they're looking at a homeless problem thinking, OK, well, all we have to do is provide more homes and that solves the problem as if the person is homeless because they just can't find a house. Right. Yeah. Uh, the majority of the people, and I know this doesn't apply to all, but the majority of people that are homeless are not homeless because they can't find a house. That they're homeless because they either they either have mental issues, or they have uh, drug issues, or something to that effect. And just giving them a house isn't going to necessarily <laughs> solve the underlying issue. And uh, you know, you may kick the can down the road. But what you're going to find is a housing complex that you're spending seven hundred thousand dollars per unit that is destroyed and unusable in a matter of six months. Right. And, um, you know, and that's unfortunately the reality of the of the situation. And um, you know, we'll we'll see how this uh, this plays out. But I guess as investors, we need to detach ourselves from the emotional component of the of the reality and understand that this is definitely a trend that we're seeing in certain states that's most likely to continue and therefore uh if 
money and capital should go where it's treated best. If we do have money uh, in play in some of these areas, it would be wise to go ahead and hit the bid and move it somewhere where um, you, you see a lot less of that or most likely you're going to see a lot less of that moving forward. You know, George, it's it's interesting because when we talk about government and how much or how little government should be involved in the economy, and I, I you know, I know we all believe they should be minimally involved, right? Uh, you know, everybody on both sides of the aisle is, will pretty much agree that government is not the most efficient. Uh, there is a lot of corruption in government. There's a lot of cronyism in government. And, you know, if you if you have the government large, you're just that corruption, cronyism and inefficiency will expand. If the government is smaller, it'll still be there. It'll just be smaller. Right. So wouldn't it just make sense to have the government be smaller so we'd contain the corruption, the cronyism and the inefficiency? Um, yeah, but you know, I'd me, argue that you, know? you actually, as a percentage, you would have a lower percentage with smaller government. A, uh, a lower percentage of that, I agree, because there'd be corruption. more accountability. People would be paying more attention. It'd be less to pay attention to. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Well, I think it's because of the, the people that it attracts. Yeah, it's, right, right. Because when government has a lot of power, mm -hmm. it attracts people. Who are sociopaths, right? They, who are power they, they hungry. Attract people who want, who have an insatiable lust to have power over other people, and that's mostly the people that you don't want in charge. But Absolutely. when government is very small and very limited and really doesn't have any power at all, it attracts people who are most likely going to be better citizens and have their head on straight. And have and because they don't want power over other people, they right. they're not sociopaths, and therefore the amount of cor corruption as a percentage is going to be lower because the people, although they're not incentivized properly, because they're still in government, right. uh, at least they're they're going to have, at least they're not going to be sociopaths that have an insatiable lust for uh, authoritarian types of of power grabs. No question about it. And, and you know, political office, if you look back to the founding of the country, right, political office was never meant to be a full-time job. It was yeah, something right. you did for a short period, and then you went back home. <laughs> you know, it wasn't supposed to be a 40-year career, ever. That was never intended. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I, going back to your point, Jason, where anyone, whether you're on the left or the right, would agree uh, that government does not usually allocate capital efficiently. Uh, we go back to prior to the Fed, talking, you know, 1910, 1911. And at that time, government spending was about three to 5% of GDP. Wow. So said, said another way, the <clears throat> private sector was yeah. responsible for about 97% of GDP. As okay, it should so be. Think, yeah, so think <laughs> about the efficiencies there when the private sector is in control of 97% of the economy compared to today where government spending is 60%, 60 percent, six zero percent of GDP. Yeah. So now yeah, the private sector, which is far more efficient, anyone can agree there. Uh, yeah. The private sector is only responsible for 40% of the GDP. So yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's absolutely it's absolutely way out of hand. By the way, one comment that just came in here, George, uh, JBL says, yep, George Washington was chosen as a general because he was wealthy. And I don't know if the meaning of that is that, you know, he didn't need the money and he wasn't trying to get in government to be powerful or I'm not sure. Maybe the meaning is the reverse of that. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe it was cronyism. I don't know. Not yeah. Sure. All right. Well, let's see. We've still got uh, well over 1,100 people that are on. Let's see if I can find another question. If not, we'll go ahead and hey, do some closing. Hey, hey by the way, George, let, let's. Um, let, hey, by the way, we're all going to see each other uh, next week that's, at your event right. in Miami. Let's let's talk about that real quick. If, you know, um, and uh, yeah, I know, I know a, lot, I a lot of comments here. A lot of people on the live stream are going to be at the event. 
Yeah, it's gonna be Capital exciting. Fly. And then uh, you, you sold it out, so you got another one in uh, what Texas, right? In twenty twenty two. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to negotiate with the hotel right now. I think we're really close to a deal. It'll be January seventh through the ninth in uh, in Houston, Texas, and we'll have some of the the same speakers, but then a lot of the the people will will be different. And um, we've got some guys that have already agreed and gals, so it's going to be just as amazing as uh, this event next weekend. George, yeah, George, well, this event sold out so quickly that folks, George had to get a bigger location for the Houston event, so he he got the Astrodome. Much bigger. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. That's half, George half is big time. You have to get a much bigger venue, that's for sure. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> hey, but we'll wait in Miami. Twenty twenty three to get the Astrodome. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're we're gonna have like uh, seven hundred people at your event in Miami. So, George, I'm I'm super excited about it. Yeah, good, it's good gonna be. It's it's really gonna be amazing. I'm going back and forth with the speakers. I mean, you guys are gonna be speaking there. And uh, one of the cool things that we're gonna be doing that I really haven't talked about is we're gonna be doing three panel discussions. So uh, as an example, I've got you guys speaking Saturday afternoon uh, after lunch. And after you guys speak, then we're gonna take an hour and the three of us are gonna do a, a panel discussion revolving around real estate. And then we're going to take questions directly from the audience. And, you know, what's interesting about that is uh, when what was it, when were we in West Palm? What was that? Maybe a month ago or something? Yeah, yeah about, uh, a month. about a month. Yeah. So Jason and I had uh, lunch with uh, Jeff Snyder. And Great guy. Really interesting. Yeah. W- one of the things that had a big impact on me after that, that lunch was I've interviewed Jeff for the show via zoom or whatever, probably at least three or four times. And I've listened to him on macro voices, you know, a hundred times. I've listened to him on real vision. I listened to his own podcast, uh, making sense. I, I listened to almost every episode, but I learned more from Jeff in that hour and a half just because we were face to face. Right. Yeah. And, and and it's not just this thing where you ask one question and then, you know, he goes off and gives you an explanation for uh, five minutes or something. It's, it's more of a back and forth type of dialogue. And, you know, the three of us were kind of going around in a circle and really we were able to flush out so many ideas in a short period of time and it's just the, the point is, as human beings, I think we're able to learn so much more and absorb so much more when we're face to face with other human beings. And I think that's going to be one of the huge opportunities for those individuals who are going to Rebel Capitalist Live to not only learn, but, but learn face to face. And I think that it's going to just, uh, you know, 10x to use a, a Grant Cardone term, uh, <laughs> you're, you're, you're learning by going there live instead of uh, watching you know, a ton of podcasts, which you should do as well. I'm not saying uh, don't watch them, uh, but uh, I think everyone's going to go away uh, or walk away from this event having so much more knowledge and so much more. Uh, I think it's going to have a profound effect on everyone. Absolutely, George. I think it's going to be great, and and you've done an awesome job already, and uh, you know your your audience is going to love it. Yeah. All right, guys. Any closing thoughts? Oh uh, well, Ken, you want to go first? Sure. Well, I think that um, uh, there's a lot of people right now trying to figure out whether to get into the real estate market. And, and I would just suggest that, um, you know, it's probably not good to be heavy in cash and, uh, you know, because of the pending potential inflation, but it doesn't always have to be in, 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 uh, in, in real estate. But if you do find real estate, like we've been able to do, just make sure that it cash flows. Cause I, I think the best formula is to use a little bit of cash 
and then use other people's money or OPM, which is bank debt at less than inflation. I think that and, and make sure that it cash flows and then have plenty of reserves, you know, which is what got us through this pandemic personally. Make sure you have plenty of reserves because we don't know, you know, what, when the next thing is going to happen. But I do believe that we're heading into a renter's market in either case because we've mm -hmm. got low supply. We've got uh, obviously issues around construction, uh, you know, and the, and the costs around construction and affordability. But then we also have this forbearance thing ending soon. So typically, like in 2008, what that did was it put a massive push on on uh, the existing rental supply and actually grew rents even further. So, so um, when in, you know, that, can uh, just to clarify, when you say renters market, did you mean to say <clears throat> landlords market or rental market or yeah, what? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yes, uh, I meant to say that you know, I, it looks to me like even though we have affordability issues, we're going to have rents increasing over a period of time uh, as a result of the fallout, just like we had in two thousand and eight. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. So, I agree. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. And, and to, just to echo what Ken said, um, you know, a lot of people ask me, uh, you know, Jason, if times are going to be tougher in the future and inflation is going to be rampant and, you know, who knows what will happen with employment ultimately? Will, will that get better or worse? And, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussions we could have about all that stuff that we all talk about on our podcast and YouTube channels. But, um, you know, the what people don't realize sometimes, they, they sort of think of, you know, they, they say these sort of uh, glib questions. They ask these kind of like glib questions like, well, then how are people going to be able to afford to rent my houses from me? Well, here's the reality. The, the pressure will go on the lifestyle. The standard of living will decline for most people, sadly. That's just the reality of it. And it has declined for many people uh, over the years. In some ways, it's gotten better because, you know, we've got technology and, you know, we've got these phones and all this stuff it is, is great. But, you know, no one's living like the average person doesn't have a quarter acre of land and a big yard. And, you know, everybody's crammed together nowadays. Right. So uh, it's like George always talks about. There's a lot of cross currents. Right. But. But that's what will happen as these rents do climb. There's a lot of rent pressure building up uh, that hasn't released into the market yet. And I think we're going to see rents go up quite significantly. We're, we're seeing it somewhat, but I think there's a lot more of it left. And I think that um, the housing prices, um, you know, one of the things I, I got to talk with Ken about yesterday on his YouTube channel is uh, this new index I'm releasing called the Hartman Comparison Index. And I'm going to talk about it at George's event. And when you compare the price of housing to a whole bunch of other things, it's actually still pretty cheap. Uh, if you're just comparing it to one thing that most people are doing, which is the dollar, it looks expensive. And I would ask you, have the house prices gone up or has the value of the dollar declined? That's really the question. And I think Everybody watching knows the answer to that without me even saying it, uh, because George, your audience knows, and, and Ken, yours does too. Uh, so, uh, you know, and just to give an example that I shared with Ken yesterday, to buy the median price house 21 years ago, literally a generation ago, the median price house, if you wanted to buy it not in dollars, but in gold, it would cost 610 ounces of gold. And today, that median price house only cost 208 ounces of gold. So priced in gold, a house is two thirds cheaper than it was a generation ago. Hmm. Like really think about that. And you know, that's pretty yeah. significant. It is more expensive than it was in 2010 though. In 2010, so just to go over those numbers again, 21 years ago in 2000, 610 ounces to buy a house of gold. In 2010, 162 ounces of gold to buy a house. Now, 208 ounces of gold to buy a house. So cheaper than it was 21 years ago, a little more expensive than it was 11 years ago. Hmm. Yeah, that's really an interesting way to look at it.
it is it maybe that's um you know when you're thinking of prices in real terms uh and you're having to deal with the cpi which is a number that is is inaccurate to totally say, bogus <laughs> you're too uh, kind george inaccurate it's bogus yeah. it's a scam <laughs> yeah. yeah maybe looking at it through the lens of gold is um yeah yeah that'd be interesting to do that with all assets Oh, George, I, I will. At your event, I'm going to compare housing to the price of oil, gold, orange juice. Oh, no, no, no. I'm talking uh, about a bunch uh, of things. Yeah. Oh, gold. other assets in general. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like gold, like the stock market valued in gold right? or uh, commodities valued in gold or oil, you know, something like that. Yeah, very yeah. interesting. Yeah. You know, I'll give. can I give you one more on that? And Ken yeah, and I yeah. talked about this yesterday um, because you mentioned the stock market. So, the most widely used measure for the stock market is the S&P 500, right? And in 2000, to buy the median price house, it would cost you 1,884 shares of the S&P to buy a median price house mm -hmm. in, in the year 2000, so 21 years ago. In 2010, it would cost you more, okay, 2,179 shares of the S&P to buy a house. But today, it only costs you 898 shares of the S&P to buy the median price house. So priced in gold and the S&P, houses are cheaper. And the one thing, I love the way you say it, George, because, and I'm going to talk about this at, at your event, you know, you always say, is it cheap or is it expensive, right? And I, I love that because that just clears away the clutter and the confusion, right? Is it cheap or expensive? And then you ask, in what terms? Gold, oil, dollars, euros, right? You know, what commodity do you want to use? Yeah. You know what my pushback would be? Is if you want to measure the price of housing in gold, you'd also have to measure the, the income right. in gold. Yep. Because, yep. because incomes, obviously, along with the interest rate, are what people use to buy the house that's that's a big component obviously the main component other than interest yeah. rates so if, if if in fact housing is a lot cheaper in terms of gold the average wage would be far less in terms of gold you know when adjusted for the real rate of inflation as well so i, I it, it it's weird because it would make housing more affordable if you had a high wage, but for the average person, it would mean their wage has gone up a lot less and their wage is still consistent with the overvaluation of the home in nominal dollar terms. Yeah, right. Good, good, good point. So I'll, I'll just tell you on that and we'll close with this. You, you guys can take it from here, but uh, 21 years ago, to make your mortgage payment on the median price house on the average income, it took 69 hours of work. There you go. To See pay that the mortgage. Is, yeah. Today, today though, it only takes 47 hours. Yeah. So, so they're cheaper. more of an apples to apples. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, let's go ahead and do some shout outs. We've got 11. 123 oh. people on here. Ken, Ken this is going to take an hour. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't, I don't shout out here. No, okay, no, let what, me let me pour another drink. <laughs> no, no, no. Like, why don't you guys, can you guys see the, the chat thing or is that just me? Yeah, I can see. Can Ken can see. Oh, no, well, I can't. You, guys, you guys, oh, you can't, Kenny? No, Jason, I can't. But I, help I can me see. out. Do some shout outs. I'm always the guy doing the shout outs. Let's oh, see. Gosh. uh your best impression of George Gammon. <laughs> how do you how do you do it? Do you just go from the top? There's so many. There's Ripley twenty twenty, uh, Mo Mono Toro Trading, M nine, Kevin Schmidt, uh, Jason Kincaid, R R, uh, Marie Casilius, R R, Fudfit, uh, J. Uh, now we're getting repeats, so I gotta just go through. It's a hell of a lot harder than it looks, isn't it? <laughs> I, it is, yeah. Adam Macias, Tech Reviews, <laughs> Kyle in PA, Jasmine, uh, Biff Biff Henderson. I <laughs> love it. Uh, we got Dennis. We got Born Like Stars. 
uh, Wayne Smith, Don H, uh, Jasmine was mentioned. Okay, there are a lot of them are repeating because they're talking to you each other, you know, in the memory, Like you play when yeah. you're a kid, when you flip over the card and you got to right. put it back and you get the other one. All right, well, good job. We'll give Hartman a round of applause. <laughs> yeah, we got Jerry. Mike. Oh, don't don't forget Gene Morris, though. Gene Morris, that's your bud right there. Our what about the unicorn? Here. What happened to the unicorn? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the unicorn already got the shout out, Ken. Yeah, yeah. The unicorn. I know, but the, I just had to. You got to wrap up with the unicorn. The oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining us. And uh, check Jason out on his YouTube channel. Uh, what's the name of your channel? Is it just Jason uh, Hartman? Jason Hartman Real Estate. Okay. Kenny, is it just Ken McElroy? Ken McElroy, yep. Okay. Awesome, guys. Thanks for joining us. Have a fantastic evening. We'll see you in the next video. Good night, Bye, everybody. everybody. Thanks. Thanks, guys.